So uh, the last last uh, week, uh, we started our Advent. Um, so Advent means coming. So Christ coming to earth as a baby for us. His coming in the believer's heart today. And his coming again in power and glory to receive his bride, the church. So the first Sunday of Advent was the candle of hope, and it reminds us that God has given us the gift of hope, hope for a better way of living here on earth and hope for eternal life with him. So today we light the candle of peace. So we light the candle of peace that there may be peace between us and God, between us and others, and even in times of uncertainty. The angels, after the birth of Jesus in Luke 2.14, sang out, Glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to those whom God is pleased. And Jesus tells us in John 14.27, Peace I leave to you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. The Apostle Paul reminds us not to worry, but to pray about everything, and then you will experience God's peace, which, extends, uh, which exceeds anything that we can understand. So I mentioned just a minute ago that we can call peace to our storms and just recently and lately, uh, Amy and I have been dealing with medical issues and things in our life that we haven't really had to deal with in a long time. Um, so there's some, there's some storms going on in our life that really we don't feel like we have in control. However, <laughs> based on our advent because of Jesus and the peace that he has given us, if you recognize there, when he came into this world... He came in and said, peace on earth. The angel said, peace on earth. He came into the world and there was peace. While he was here, there was peace. He called the storms, peace, be still. And then when he left, what did he say? He said, peace I leave with you. And he gave us the Holy Spirit. We have him. We accept him. Even though we have storms in our life, we can say, Peace. We can speak peace into our lives, speak peace into our physicalness. We can speak peace into our mind and into our mental things. And he's there to help us through those things, to give us peace during those times. We're not on shaky ground. Amen? Amen. Amen. I want you to take 10 seconds and think about your life right now. Where don't you have peace in your life? Or where would you like God's peace to intervene in your life? Let's just take a few seconds and think about that, and then I'm going to pray. So pray with me. Dear God, thank you for the peace that is ours because we know Jesus. Thank you that it's not a shallow peace or a conditional peace like the world. Thank you that it is big and surpasses our understanding. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. We're just going to slowly do our sound check here until we are at a point where we feel good, okay? No. <laughs> Don's like, you're all laughing at me, and I'm going to laugh back, but I'm going to beat him with the mic afterwards. So, Well, I'm glad to be here with you this morning to be able to share a little bit on peace. Uh, there's a ton of scripture, but that is for good reason. And just so you guys know, I'm going to be reading the scripture off the screen so uh, as we go, I'll kind of give you like an expert prompt on the next one, and then that way we can go from there. 
But uh, one of the things about peace, one of the things about the English language right now is that on average, every word in our language has 3.5 definitions. So it's really easy for us to talk about peace and then you know, what you think is peace is different than what you think is peace, which is different than what you think is peace. And, and here's Jason, like Jason has this script and he's reading and everything he said is correct. Yet what we're going through right now and how we're defining what peace is could be very different. And so we walk out different on different pages than where we were when we came in. And some of us might even be a little confused on what peace is. And so this morning, we're gonna define that with our main point, because our main point this morning is this, is that Jesus came to give us biblical peace. If we're gonna talk about the Bible, and we're gonna ask for the Holy Spirit and for the Son, Jesus, and for God the Father to be the center of our life, we need to allow his word, the Bible, the books that make the Bible to define the words and phrases that we use on a regular basis. So, as Jesus came to give us biblical peace, let's allow that to happen. So what does peace mean according to the 66 books of the Bible? Because even then, if you get deep into it and you start braining out on the different pieces of what peace is, you got to remember that the Old Testament, before Jesus, is written in a different language than the New Testament, mid-Jesus, post-Jesus. And so it's actually two to three different languages of different authors that create different books of the same book that we call the Bible. And yet all of them mean the same thing when it comes to peace. See, peace in the Bible and the different books is shalom. Shalom is not an outward type of peace. It's not a smile at someone and wink and feel good and throw the peace sign type of peace. Shalom is an inner peace. It's a peace that permeates. It's a peace that, that describes the relationship of love and loyalty between us and God, and it's not or, it's and, it describes the love and loyalty we have with each other, with, with people who are created in the image of God. Before Jesus, in the Old Testament, the, the, the concept of shalom is that there is inner welfare, prosperity, and wholeness, as well as an absence of hostility. Now, let's make sure that we allow the Bible to define what we're talking about here. Shalom is not outward, it's inward. Inward welfare, inward prosperity. So let's not turn off once we hear that word, because that's a trigger word. Are we being real here? Not outward prosperity, inward prosperity. And inward wholeness. And when we allow those things to fill us like a cup, if we have bad things in the cup, but we put good stuff in, eventually the bad stuff will float out because of the law of displacement. So if we have inner wholeness, welfare, and prosperity, that means the absence of hostility between us and God and us and others disappears. That is what shalom means. That is a really long definition to understand what it means, but once we understand it, then all of a sudden things begin to be clear on why peace is part of the Advent season, why Advent means coming, and why peace was coming. The New Testament, the only thing different, even though it's written in a different language, it's Greek. The Old Testament is Hebrew and Aramaic. The New Testament's Greek, yet it means the exact same thing. The only thing is that because Jesus is here, everything is rooted in Jesus. Jesus is the source of peace. So we get to this point, this biblical definition. Let's read some scripture that bring it home. The first one is going to be, of course, the, the, the famous Christmas one that's found in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, and it says this, 
before a child is born to us, a son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called, Jesus will be called, Wonderful Counselor. Which, why do we go to counselors? Right, we're being real, right? Why do I see a counselor once a month? Why have I seen counselors for many years? Me, personally, being real. So that I can experience peace, inner welfare, prosperity, and wholeness. He will be called Mighty God. He will be called Everlasting Father. He will be called Prince of Shalom. So what about the New Testament? What does it mean now with the New Testament? Because that scripture was talking about one day a child will be born and all of this fun stuff will happen. Well, let's take a look at Matthew chapter 6. Wait a minute. The Lord's Prayer has peace in it? I don't remember that. Oh, contraire, mon frere. <laughs> Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. Our Father who resides in his place of perfection. May your name be number one in our life. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Right now we know that earth, there is hostility. But we're praying that today, whatever's going on today, that in my life, and in those around my life, that they would experience a glimpse of heaven as if I were actually living there. Shalom. Inner peace. Prosperity, welfare, wholeness. Give us today the food that we need. In order for me to live like I am in heaven, that means you need to supply all my needs to where I have inner shalom. And forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who have sinned against us. May we have love and loyalty between each other, God and us, as well as the people that are within our community. And here's the best part. This is the one that we get confused with all the time. But we say it because we want to sound spiritual. Do not let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. Why in the world is this here after all of the fluffy, nice stuff? Because if we are to experience shalom, we are not going to experience shalom when we're experiencing shalom. Why on earth, if we are living in a time of peace, would we pray for a time of peace? He's already given it to us. Yet here we are, and we are asking, Lord, I live in a broken world, and there is hostility all around me. I'm asking you, do not let temptation come to my door. But if temptation comes, because I live in a broken world, would you rescue me from the evil one? It's a two-layer process. One, would I see if temptation is coming? Keep it away from me. But God, I'm not an idiot, and I understand. I live in a world that's broken and hostile, and there's chaos all around. So if there's chaos, Lord, would you rescue me from that chaos? Give me shalom, which is part of the food that I need you to give me every day in my daily bread. Hopefully you're beginning to see that in the scripture that we read and in the lives that we live, we want God's shalom. We want biblical shalom, that Jesus came to give us biblical shalom. But that also means that there's going to be times where we are in a world of chaos and in a situation of chaos. 
of confusion, of uncertainty. Things are going to happen, and they're not always good because we live in a world that's broken and chaotic. So now that we understand what it means for biblical shalom and and the concept of biblical shalom, Oh, no, wait, I got one more, don't I? Throw it up there, girl. We can make our own plans, but the Lord gives the right answer. Sometimes we come up with our own stuff. and We try to manipulate things on our own, but in the end, based upon the Lord's Prayer, based upon things in the past, based upon how the Bible has been written. And we see that there is, there is chaos all over. But with Jesus, but with the Lord, he gives the right answer. And the right answer at times is for us to just be still and know that he is God. To be still and practice internal wholeness and prosperity And welfare. This whole idea of internal peace is found in Jesus. That's why he came. He's the Prince of Peace. His name is the Wonderful Counselor, that even when we experience chaos, that he will give us peace. So, why would we think that peace is anything else when everything that we talk about here has to do with heart, attitude, and motivation? I mean, Jesus talks about it all the time. Even in the same large scripture of Matthew chapter 6, you know, before that and after that, he goes, listen, I know you guys, you have heard it say, do not murder. But I say, in your heart, when you hate your neighbor, you commit that sin. It says, do not commit adultery, but I tell you, if you lust in your heart, everything is based on inter- on internal heart condition, heart motivation, heart attitude, the root cause. And so for us to experience biblical shalom, internal peace, it needs to be found deep inside of us. It needs to be rooted deep with the Holy Spirit, taking care of it and watering it and allowing its fruit to come out. So it all sounds really good, right? Like that sounds great, like inward prosperity. Well, I don't believe in outward prosperity from the Lord, but I do believe that he can give me inward prosperity. That's part of the Lord's prayer. But how do I actually apply that today? How how can I walk out the door and go, okay, I need to come up with a game plan. Father, I'm praying to you. I'm asking you to give me all that I need. How can I begin this habit of applying and practicing peace in our life, in my life, in my family's life. Well, let's take a look at what the Bible says, specifically Philippians. Don't worry about anything. Worry means letting your mind dwell on trying to answer every negative situation that you come across. Again, long definition for one word, right? Don't let your mind dwell on trying to answer every negative situation you come across by yourself. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray. Instead, communicate to God about everything. Tell God what you need Tell God what you need in the future and thank him for what he has done in the past. It's not either or, it's a both and. It's almost like saying, God, because you've answered my prayer in the past, I trust that you can do it again in the future. And it's not a one-off. Thank you, you answered this prayer, now I I guess I spent all my money on that, you know, on paying for that one piece of the vending machine. Now I can't get another snack later on because now I have no more cash. 
Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's shalom. Tell him what you need. Thank him for what he's done. When we do that, we will experience God's shalom, which exceeds anything we can understand. Which that makes sense. Because those of us who have gone through severe trial, severe pain, seasons, where we feel like, where are you, God? And people go, how are you getting through that? I don't know how I'm getting through this. I just know that God is with me. Don't ask me to define it or explain it or come up with something smart. I don't know. I just know I'm getting through it. Why? Because it is a peace that, ex that exceeds anything that we can understand. His peace will guard our hearts and minds as we live in Christ Jesus. Now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts, blah, 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 blah. Uh, uh, what's his name? Norm went through this a couple weeks ago. But look at the last sentence. Putting this into practice, all that you learned and received from me, everything you heard from me, and saw me doing, then what? When all of this, when we are practicing this, when we're allowing the Holy Spirit to root in our hearts and allow this to grow in us and come out, what will happen? Then the God of Shalom will be with us. It doesn't always make sense. Like, we want to put it in an equation and make it work, but it just doesn't always make sense. I know. Again, I referenced, and this is kind of my last point here. I, said, I mentioned earlier that I, go to, that I see a counselor once a month. Fourth, fourth Wednesday right now over Zoom. One of the times that I was in counseling, because I've been in counseling for a long time, I had my counselor tell me about experiencing peace and trusting God and not feeling like the whole world is on my shoulders. And they said, well, let's take a look at what does 1 Peter 5, 6, and 7 say? And they just threw the scripture like it, had everything, every answer to every question that I ever had. Brandon, you got to humble yourself under the mighty power of God, and at the right time, he will lift you up in honor. Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. I'm sitting on the couch, and I'm thinking, how do I give something that I can't tangibly hold to someone I can't tangibly see? I'm sorry, can you please tell, I mean, that's a great scripture, but can you please tell me, how do I take worry off? Did you not hear me? And they do the exact same thing. They, just, they give the exact same scripture. Did you not hear what I said? Give all your cares and worries to God, for he cares about you. And I'm at a point where I'm like, Talk to me like I'm a kindergartner. Because this means nothing to me. Like this means everything and this means nothing at the same time. I mean, this is like one of those Bible stories where Jesus is talking and the guy's child like needs to be healed. And Jesus says, all you have to do is believe. And the dad goes, I believe. Help me my unbelief. And we read that and we go, I don't understand that. Well, that's okay because I'm just going to read the next story that I do understand. Because that makes no sense to me. For me, I was at a point where I'm like, I need you to talk to me like a kindergartner. How do I practice this? How do I practice don't worry, instead pray? Don't tell me that not to worry. I'm a human being. Like, that's what I do. Let's stop being spiritual and start telling me what I can do to understand how to make this work. And after that, when it was like, you need to talk to me like a kindergartner because this doesn't make sense. Don't tell me what I need to do. 
give me an idea on how to do it. And even the counselor at that point goes, I get it now. Because sometimes the language we speak has 3.5 different definitions. So I'm asking a question. They're answering my question, yet I don't understand because the language we were speaking was different. But once we were on the same page, all of a sudden, now the biblical interpretation of that verse can come out. And for me, this is what I do. Because you might be in the same spot I was, thinking, okay, great, all these scriptures sound wonderful, but how do I actually practice them when I go out the door today? For me, I have to imagine a yoke or a U-shaped collar that goes on a horse or goes on an ox. And I have to, in my mind, feel the weight of that worry on my shoulders. And I have to take a moment and I have to close my eyes and I, I have to imagine that yoke coming off of my shoulders, that U-shaped collar coming off of my shoulders and then somehow allowing the, the imaginary anthropomorphic hand of God to take it and put it on him. Because for him, when I read scripture, I read him say, come to me those who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Give me your yoke, and I will give you mine. For my burden is easy, and my yoke is light. That is what I have to do. Now, for you, it might be something different, and that's okay. As long as the root is giving our cares and worries to the Lord because he cares for us, and he wants us to experience biblical shalom, inner welfare, inner prosperity, inner wholeness, in a time of hostility. As we go to our tables, there is a load of scripture. And you guys can do, it. I am freeing you up, your table, to do whatever you want to do. If you want to go through the scriptures and go, what does this mean to you? What is it speaking to you? What's the character of God? What's the character? You know, absolutely, I'm freeing you up. Abs go ahead and do that. But the purpose of the scriptures that I picked out for today was for us to take a look at in the scripture that we read, there is chaos and hostility, and there's inner peace, inner shalom, inner wholeness, and how the Lord brings those things out in moments of chaos. And I would like you guys to read some of the scriptures and answer them as vulnerable as you can. But also allow others to do the same. Please make sure that you're using I statements, especially today. Again, how I deal with cares and worry and how I practice inner shalom, how the Lord operates that in me, may not be exactly to the T the same way it works for you. And guess what? It doesn't matter as long as we are rooted in inner shalom. As long as we are rooted in the Holy Spirit to allow him to operate in how we were wired and born to be. If you want to ask clarifying questions, I ask you to ask those clarifying questions. But let's not ask challenging questions. Because challenging questions on how the Holy Spirit works in someone's life doesn't always communicate and come across the same way you intend. So it's okay to ask for clarifying questions. But let's make sure we're not asking questions to challenge someone. That can be a conversation for another time. Let's remember that we are practicing shalom, which is love and loyalty between God and us, as well as God and other, or us and others. Love and loyalty between each other. 
And let's pray and ask that wherever we are, no matter what we're facing, that we are allowing the Holy Spirit to be the wonderful counselor and to give us inner shalom, or to give us shalom, which is the inner welfare, the inner wholeness in a season and situation where there is absolute hostility. Father, thank you so much for sending your son to to allow us to experience shalom on earth. We do pray that as we keep your name high and keep your name number one, as you are in heaven, would your will be done and your word be caught and your shalom be experienced here in this moment as if we were actually living in heaven? Would you help us today give us all that we need? And would you forgive us any time where we've been disobedient to your word? Would you help us forgive those who have caused chaos and hostility in relationship? We pray that as we go out at the end of our time today, that we know that we live in a broken world. And so we pray that temptation stays far from us. But if we find it near, would you deliver us from the one that wants us to stumble? Help us experience shalom in our tables today. In Jesus' name, amen.